Christmas. He would have liked for Abraham to say something kind and reassuring to him. He wanted him to say, have a safe journey. But don't worry. You're going to be fine. But he knew that he could have stood there for years and no such false reassurances would have come. Don't keep him waiting, Abraham said. Give him the note and the rest of your money and do whatever he tells you. My father walked away from Abraham wishing that he had never come here. He looked around him and saw the same scene that he had seen every day. A long, poorly organized parade of men, mostly black with a few occasional shades of light brown, stripped down to their barest piece of clothing and almost always loaded with something on their backs. There were herds of donkeys who fared only a little worse than those crowding the one unpaved road that ran adjacent to the harbor, the sun that shone down harshly on all of them. My father tried to get a read on the man's face as he approached him to see if there were any signs of malice if he could be detected in his eyes or smile. The man kept his head turned away from him, but the only thing my father could see were the folds in the blue headscarf the man was wearing as they trembled in the breeze. When he was halfway to the ship, Abraham called out to my father, I'll be waiting to hear from you. And my father knew that was the last time he would ever hear that man's voice again. My father handed over the slip of paper Abraham had given him. He couldn't read what was written on it and was worried that it might say any one of a, different, of a dozen different things. From treat this man well to take his money and do whatever you want with him. He told himself that he was a fool for being so trusting and that there was nothing else he could do but be a fool. It was too, too late already. Events had been set in motion and the only thing was to do was to silently follow the man up the gangplank and into the boats where they entered unmolested as if the crew had failed to notice them or had been expecting them the whole time. The man pointed to a small storage slot near the stern of the boat that were used for holding the more delicate cargoes. These crates were unusually loaded last and he had often seen people waiting at the docks for hours to receive them. They always bore the stamp of a Western country and carried their instructions in a foreign language. Cuidado, fragil. He had, he had unloaded several such crates himself recently. And while he had never known their contents, he had tried to guess what was inside. Cartons of powdered milk, a television, a stereo, vodka, scotch, Ethiopian coffee, soft blankets, clean water, hundreds of new shoes and shirts and underwear. Anything that he was missing or knew he would never have he imagined arriving in those boxes. There was a square hole just large enough for my father to fit into if he pulled his knees up to his chest. He understood this was where he was supposed to go, and yet he naturally hesitated sizing up the dimensions just as he had once sized up the crates he had helped unload. He considered its angles and its depth and then imagined all the ways in which he could and could not move inside that box. He could lean his body slightly to the side and rest his head against the wall when he needed to sleep. He could cross his legs. He could not raise his elbows above his head. My father felt the man's hand around his neck pushing him toward the crates. His father had often done the same thing to him as a child and also to a goat or a sheep when it was being led to the compound to be slaughtered. He wanted to tell that man that he was prepared to enter the boat on his own, and in fact had been prepared to do so for months, but he wouldn't have been understood. So my father let himself be led. He crawled in on his knees, which was not how he would have liked to enter. At first was the way to go, but it was too late now. In a final humiliating gesture, the man shoved him with his foot stuffing him inside so quickly that his legs and arms collapsed around him. He had just enough time to arrange himself before the man sealed the entrance shut with the wooden door that was resting nearby. Before getting on the boat, my father had made a list of things to think about in order to get through the journey. In the preceding weeks, he had come up with several items he recorded in his head by repeating them over and over until he fell asleep. They are filed away under topic headings such as the place where I was born, my plans for the future, and important words in English to remember. He wasn't sure if he should turn to them now or wait until the boat was out of the harbor. The darkness inside the box was startling, but it wasn't complete. Light still filtered in through the entrance and continued to do so until the hold was closed and the boat began to pull away from the shore. He remembered that as a child he had often been afraid of the dark. A foolish, almost impossible thing for a country boy, but there it was. Of the vast extended family that lived around him, his mother was the only one who never mocked him for this. 
And even though he would have liked to save her image for last, for later in that journey, at a point where he was far off to sea, he let himself think about her now. He saw her as she looked shortly before she died. She had been a large woman, but at that point there wasn't much left of her. Her hair hadn't gone gray yet, but it had been cut short on the advice of a cousin who had dreamed that the illness attacking her body was buried somewhere in her head and needed a way out. Desperate, she had cut it completely off, which had made her look younger even than her 30-odd years. This was the image he had of his mother in an almost doll-like state just months before she died. And while he would have liked to have had a better memory of her, he settled for the one he had been given and closed his eyes to concentrate on it. It would be some minutes before he noticed the engine turning as the ship pulled up its anchors and slowly headed out to sea. When I reached this point in my story, I knew it was the last thing I was going to tell my class. The bell rang, and as when I first began this story, there was a good 10 to 15 seconds when no one in the classroom moved. My students, for all their considerable wealth and privilege, were still at that age where they believed that the world was a fascinating, remarkable place, worthy of curious inquiry and close scrutiny. And I'd like to think I had reminded them of that. Soon enough, they will grow out of that and concern themselves with the things that are the most obvious and relevant to their own lives. They will opt for the domestic and local news any day of the week. They will form rigid political alliances and dogmatic convictions that place them in good standing with one group or another. But at that time, these things had yet to pass. Eventually, one bag was picked off the floor and 28 others joined. Most of my students waved and nodded their head as they left the room. And there was a part of me that wanted to call them back to their seats and tell them that the story wasn't finished yet. Getting out of Sudan was only the beginning. There was still so much more ahead. Sometimes in my imagination, that is exactly what I tell my students. I pick up where I left off and I go on to describe how despite all appearances, my father did not make, actually make it off that boat alive. He arrived in Europe just as Abraham had promised he would. But an important part of him died during the journey, somewhere in the final three days when he was reduced to drinking his urine for water and could no longer feel his hands or feet, and was certain that if death came to him, he would welcome it without the slightest hesitation. He spent six months afterwards in a detention camp on an island off the coast of Italy. He was surprised to find that there was plenty of other men like him there, from every possible corner of Africa, and that many had fared worse than him. He heard stories of men who had died trying to make a similar voyage, who had suffocated or been thrown overboard alive. My father couldn't bring himself to pity them. Contrary to what Abraham had told him, there was nothing remotely heaven about where he was held. One large whitewashed room with cots every 10 inches and bars over the windows. He had a hard time understanding most of what the guards said. They often yelled at him and the other prisoners. The guards spat at their feet and made vague animal sounds when they looked at them confused. My father quickly learned a few words in Italian and was mocked viciously the first time he used them. He was once forced to repeat a single sentence over and over to each new guard who arrived. When he tried to refuse, his first meal of the day, a plate of cold dried meat and stale bread was taken away from him. Speak, the guards commanded. And he did so dozens of times in the course of several days, even though there was no humor left in it for anyone. You speak Italian, the guards asked. No, he said. After which the subject of the sentence was always dropped and the question transformed into an order. Speak, talk, or more rarely, say something. In Italy, he was given asylum and set free. And from there, he worked his way north and west across Europe. He met dozens of other men like Abraham along the way. Men who promised him that when they made it to London, the rest of their lives would finally resolve into the picture they had imagined. It's different there, they always said. They placed their faith in that difference, which is to say they placed their faith in the idea that there had to be at least one place in this world where life could be lived in accordance with the plans and dreams they had concocted from themselves. For most, that was London. For a few, it was Paris. And for a smaller but bolder few, America. That faith had carried them this far, and even though it was weakening, it needed constant readjustment. Rome is not what I thought it would be. France will surely be better, some said. It persisted out of sheer necessity. 
By the time my father finally made it to London 18 months later, he had begun to think of all the men he met as being variations of Abraham, all of them crippled and deformed by their dreams. Abraham had followed him all the way to London to test him, and my father was determined to settle that debt. On the first day in the city, my father found a quiet corner in Hampstead Heath. A guidebook for Americans that he had picked up in France had said that he would be afforded a wide-sweeping view of the city from there. At the edge of the park, with London at his feet, my father set fire to all the documents he had brought with him from Sudan. The fake marriage license Abraham had given him turned to ashes in seconds, along with a picture of Abraham's daughter, which melted away near a large green hedge with ripe inedible berries hanging from it. For many nights afterwards, he refused to think about Abraham. There are no rewards in life for such stupidity, and he promised himself never to fall victim to that kind of blind, wishful thinking. Anyone who did so deserved whatever suffering he was bound to meet. <clears throat> I will actually stop there. And actually, what it, what's great is if um, people have questions, um, I'm happy to, to have a conversation, a debate, arguments.